Welcome to the Influence Factory podcast. This program is dedicated to support professionals who have a desire to develop their digital business influence so they can navigate through a fast-paced, constantly growing digital world. We invite newcomers as well as our family of business influencers to a place to play, share ideas, questions, tips, and guidance with other thought leaders around the globe. Sit back and enjoy our program with our host, Dean Delisle, as he interviews guests. News and commentary is provided by Kate Hassett and Jackson Delisle. Power Move lessons are provided by the Influencer Marketing Department at Social Jack. And production, editing, and distribution is provided by the Social Jack production team. All right, this week's influencer guest, Joe Strazeri, is an attorney and counselor for successful families and business owners, an educator for wealth advisors, and a speaker and author. As a former general contractor, land developer, and business owner, Joe combines these skills along with more than 20 years of experience as an attorney to counsel families and business owners like me. Uh, the, through five unique brands with his partners, Joe educates wealth advisors, assists business owners to find what's next, as well as protects families and their assets through a unique planning process called Care to Know Planning. The Care to Know model celebrates the inherent magic of nuance that exists between individuals as they navigate life and business. So everybody, please meet my business advisor and good friend, Joe Strazeri. Joe, how are you doing? Good, how are you guys? Good. And there's Shelly off to the side. Look at her, rocking and rolling. <laughs> we all have the people that make things happen, right? So, uh, Shelly, it's just good to see you off to the side over there. But, Joe, uh, just such a blessing. I know you are super busy. You travel. Uh, you do more events than uh, I think you and I might be tied for or whatever. But uh, I love those guitars behind you. Can you give us any sense for what those are from? Sure. Um, I, it's probably too small for you to be able to see, but um, on the print behind me, we uh, every two years our local children's hospital hosts a vet and a vet and a venue where there are concerts, and they take um, uh, one of the bands that's going to be there for a night. They convince that band to be there the night before, and they have a charity event. And typically, one of our brands, Missouri Mancini, will be the host of that evening, and it'll be branded both that children's hospital and us. And that was from 2012 with, with the Doobie Brothers, the guitar they signed, and our team with the guitar, but Steve singing with the Doobie Brothers. And this was from 14, where we did that with Casey and the Sunshine Band, and Steve sang with him, one of my partners. So it's us showing that we do support our charities, as you might see in other parts of our office, but also as, um, as an interesting part of our clients to be able to see the kind of work that we do. Yeah, that's awesome. And that's one thing that always stood out from the day that I met you uh, with your events and and even without the events, uh, you've always uh, given back to the community and, and many charities um, and, and things like that. So uh, has that always been from the get-go or did that change somewhere along the way where you all of a sudden you started doing that? Um, the charity work, um, Steve and I, you know, in the early years of a partnership, uh, we each had independent profitable practices. Eventually a partner, Alex, joined us who had an independent practice, and the three of us partnered into the first firm, Strazeri Mancini. Over time, we've had we've had a couple of partners, we've had many associates, and we've had strategic byproducts from our law firm. So Strazeri Mancini first had an offshoot of um, California, I'm sorry, uh, Southern California Institute. We decided that we educated to motivate, we love to teach, and when we invited people to come to our law firm or financial planner firm or CPA firm to learn something, the results of that were lower if you were to track how many people booked, how many people showed, how many people converted an appointment, and then from an appointment, how many people actually showed up here, and then from that appointment, decided to buy, and then we're happy clients. If you were to track that, when we invited from one of the professional services or going to a golf course or going to a hotel, whatever else, we found that an institute had a better return rate all the way across and by going to advertising from, et cetera. And we were able to expand our ability to do that with other advisors. As that happened and we broke off an institute to do that, which was a loss leader, as Shelley often refers to it, a for loss organization, um, we ended up buying other educational institutes and suddenly it started to break even. And then it was feeding our firm and we left the world of 
the hamster wheels of go generate business, go work the business, go fix the employees back and forth, back and forth, to institutionalize the, how things came in. And I know I make Dean and Jackson smile when I talk about the funnel. Um, and it also gave us the ability to go enter the digital world. That's a very long explanation to suggest once the stability of the flow came in and the processing of how to do it, the profits increased such that we started to look at what work would we do for free or how would we help the world and should that brand us as well as help the world. So we developed some metrics on what's close to our heart, Sharp Hospital, Children's Hospital, what subcategory of that Autism and children's hospital is important to our heart because the relatives are not. Or traumatic brain injuries are um, at Sharp Hospital helping veterans because it sees veterans back up. And then we said, how can we give of our, we say to charities, you must suffer our time and talents to get our treasure. <laughs> That's cool. I like that saying. So with them, the children's, we would help them put on the event and then we would choose where the money would go and our business acumen would help with, is it starting a new thing that could be profitable on its own afterwards, like the Autism Discovery Institute or Alexis Place that we help with. So we started to add charitable work to our bailiwick in that we choose one charity a year to help. Sometimes they have two years run where they have to suffer our time and talent. We help with some of their events. We host an event that you guys have been to, a gala, for them. And it's just become part of our culture on how we give back. And when clients ask on charitable planning, well, what do you do? We've got this robust conversation over what we've done through a number of years. So here we show history and we can talk about last year. So I think it was to answer your question, once the stability of the business, first business happened, then we have the bandwidth to add permanently a charitable component. I would say that though I cannot identify revenue from being at that event or being at that event, I can identify the relationships from referral sets or the relationships with clients that point to that event as having seen us before. So I couldn't give you a percentage of what I caused it, but I can say that it adds to our brand. Yeah, that's great. I'd like to come back to that at, um, in a little bit, but I want to take us back for a minute. So uh, I understood that. Um, uh, you know, it's funny, you started out as a general contractor by trade, and uh, you literally hammered nails as a as a carpenter uh, to work your way through law school. Uh, um, yes, um, although I enjoy being the general, because most general contractors do two or three subs as well. So my crews could do framing and um, concrete, because that's fairly common for a general, and to hire other people for specifics. Um, yes, but my tool belt no longer fits. Um, I live close to the coast, and apparently the saltwater shrank my tool belt, and it doesn't fit around anymore. <laughs> so I just have to ask, are you the handy guy around the house now because you have all these skills, or do you just contract everything out? Um, I have very pretty tools now in a very pretty <laughs> tool box, a variety of them. They're yellow or red. And I have a pretty tool bench um, and where my tools used to have what's called mud, you know, drywall mud or concrete on them or paint. Now they're all very pretty and they're all very organized. And I, my wife laughs at me because, you know, I have these containers where you get to unsnap it and open. It has compartments of different size nuts and bolts and screws and connectors and all that. And I get very excited to go to a project. My daughter would say, yes, I am, but she has to wait three or four weeks for me to do it. My son would say, you're just going to complain while you're doing it, that you hit your hand or cut whatever or broke something else. Um, and my wife would say, she's given up on giving me honeydew lists because it's a source of controversy. So quite often when a contractor comes over for a thing, she'll have them do the rest. I'll pay the initial bill and it'll be done. So that's yeah. a long way to say, I am, damn it, but my family just doesn't understand I know, I know. And Holly and Holly would say she wears the tool belt in the family, which she does for the most part. And I'm uh, while I am, I do like doing some of the things I would rather just get to uh, entertaining more people <laughs> if I had a choice. <laughs> Very much so. <laughs> um, one thing that uh, impressed me when we met 
And, uh, and so, you know, it's a funny, it's a funny story. You and I, uh, you actually tell it way better than I, I think I remember meeting you and Shelly, uh, in the, in the lobby of the hotel by the bar. And I think we were coming in for EPI or one of the conferences. And then next thing you know, uh, we hit it off there and then we wound up sitting with two separate parties at the same restaurant back to back, back to back. And then we decided we wanted to be with each other just as much as we wanted to be with the people we were with, I believe, and somehow wound up sharing wine and, and having a good uh, good evening over it. So, but that, but that also talks about, I mean, you, you've got an influencer program. It also talks about when you're an influencer, it's more than posting something on, a, on social media or not. There are other things. You, do you have a litmus test inside of your soul to identify or an opportunity filter to identify people that you want to hang out with. And if you find people you want to hang out with, you also have a way to tell, do they also have an ability to positively affect our, our business life or financial life? And then lastly, do they have follow through? And our trifecta is, is this a person or an entity that we like? Yeah. Are we in alignment? Is our soul believe in that? Can they positively affect our business? And do they have follow through, which is the biggest one? And if we find somebody like you and, and Jackson, where all those three, three things are true, you figure it out. We tried over a number of years. Some of the prizes we did together were, were wildly successful. Some weren't. But every time we went back to, we're trying very hard. How do we make this work? Because these three things are true. Yeah, that's that's interesting, and and so when you first meet people, because you know we have a lot of uh, influencers that listen to the program that are in a variety of business and space of their career and things like that. Um, one thing that attracted me to you, and and I I don't think I'm I, I do a little I, I I do mostly gut checking on people, but I felt uh, I felt. Um, your your willingness to collaborate, and that's such an overused term today. But I, I want to, you know, I named this, uh, or we named this episode about being transparent and authentic. And I think that is that is the 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 formula where I was like, when I met Joe out of the gate, he said, you know, he wore it on his sleeve, and it's 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 whatever he was feeling. He said. And you still do that. So if you think I'm screwing up, you'll be like, now, do you see how you screwed up? <laughs> you don't, you don't pull any punches and I, and I feel it and you'll go, I'll probably hurt your feelings on what I'm about to say. So you do at least let me know sometimes when it's coming, but it's, it's for my own good and it's because you care. And so have, have you, I mean, have you always been like this or did you evolve into a collaborator sort of caring person like that? I believe that um, a group called the Expertive Futures Institute helped me understand the technical things that I do is half of what it is. And the other half that actually makes a client show up and say yes is interpersonal skills. So okay. there was a, a dive in that direction. So if the e-myth type of stuff is this, how do you process, how do you, um, how do you have technical ability, et cetera, there's also why does a client show up and why do they say yes which is partially on this, and the more technical are, you want it to be this, as opposed to, is there an interpersonal skill of, do, when they interact with your brand online or through other people, or they see it somewhere at an event like this, do they say, those are my people? So um, it, it was an evolution. I'd say a watershed moment for me, 10, 12 years ago, uh, Stephen, my partner and I, uh, were meeting with another couple that own a business. and. We were talking about partnering with them or not or buying their business. And um, the wife said to me, you know, Joe, um, it's hard for us because when we interact with you, your mind travels so fast and you talk about things that we feel like we understand what you're, you know, what you're getting to and we're being corralled into that. And it feels badly for us. And so through a larger conversation, she discovered, she said, it could not be true that you've thought through all of these possibilities before we sit together. There's no way a human mind does that. It's so unhealthy. My partner, Steve, laughed. And he, she said, what? And he said, choose any moment you want and ask Joe 
for the 10 minutes to two hours before that, what he processed. So she chose a moment and I rattled off what it was. And she stood there with her hand over her mouth for about 10 minutes. And she said, Joe, do you know how mentally unhealthy that is? I said, yeah, but I don't know how to do it. This is respect for me showing up to a meeting. And she said, do you know, it would make it so much easier if you could share ahead of time your predisposition. And if you thought through something, because then the other side would say, oh, they've given reverence to it and they're thinking they're a little bit ahead of me. I understand this. So it, it really entered my life that wouldn't it be better to be more upfront with people? Now, mind you, it makes you more vulnerable and it's yeah. less strong of a business position, but it causes more frank conversations. You always ask for permission. Yes. So like Shelly's with me here, Shelly says that I asked for package report. So getting rapport is the best way to be in, in a conversation with somebody that you have good rapport. Well, packaged rapport on a bad subject is to ask permission to do that thing. And if they assent, they know that it's coming and you keep rapport, although you cover a bad thing. So often, like you said, Dean, I will say, Dean, I'm liable to offend you. Do you want me to do this the, the short way like that? Or do you want me to do an hour lead up so it feels better as we talk about it? <laughs> Um, so I think that there was an impetus 12 years ago on that. It's always kind of, I'm more upfront than the average bear, but now I'm even more upfront to tell somebody my bias and my predisposition. So even when I do large conferences and I speak up front, I ask the audience, who does this, who does that, how do you get paid? And I survey them and it takes two or three minutes, and then I do two or three minutes on, please realize my predisposition. I'm licensed for these things. I have entities that do these things. I'm at this point in my age. I believe in these things. So I'm liable to show this side because this is how I get paid. If I was a one of these, one of those, one of the others, I might go show a different side. I'll try to be balanced, but please realize my bias. Yeah, that's, uh, that's interesting. And uh... Uh, Pete Chrisman is in the audience today and said to say hi. Hey. <laughs> and uh, and he's like, it's easier to do with more experience and aging. That's an advantage to getting older. <laughs> and I say, I'm just getting, I was never a patient person to begin with. And I I have felt myself get less patient and, and, and be more direct. And uh, anything to the to the people that are younger than us out there that you would say to them? Yes. Um, I do think, well, first off, every one of our offices um, or our conference rooms have these um, polished uh, river stones and they say curiosity on them. Every rock in here and every rock in each one of those bowls in every, off in every conference room. I'd say the first part is my partner, Steve, as you can tell, I have a lot of respect for him. Um, has two kind of things that might seem trite to a younger person, but I believe to be true. Um, one, if you can always keep curiosity. The more technically proficient you get, the more you think you have to listen to somebody less and you can make a judgment call. You're able to separate the wheat from the chaff. And you can not have to listen to it as long because it's extra information you don't need. And more often than not, the extra information would change your opinion if you were listening. So the first part is this curiosity piece. Steve would also say, if you're going to share with somebody, let it pass through the three gates. Is it true? Is it necessary? Is it kind? So that's the second concept. So curiosity would be one. True, necessary, and kind would be three. Uh, uh, number two. And on number three, listening isn't about taking in data until you get to speak again. It's about making what you're going to say next different because of what was said. Say that, one, say that one more time, please. Often people talk about listening and mirroring and all the rest. And most people treat listening as in, I need to wait till the other person's done talking to share my piece and I take some notes. I would suggest that that's true, but your response should be based on what they said, not a continuation of what you were saying before they started to speak. And those kind of small changes, curiosity, 
treating us very very kind and making sure that your conversation is based on the words that the person just said, not on what you wanted to make your point, changes the conversation and allows you to get more data than you ever was would have. Lastly, on the back end of emotion, on the back end of emotion, tends to come out truisms that somebody did not want to tell you. Uh-huh. So if I was sitting here with Shelly and we got into an argument, if Shelly's blood pressure rose and she got agitated and she got sippy or harsh, more often than not, I would be trained to throttle that down. I'm not going to stoke the fire, but if I let that happen, she's more apt in the middle of a tirade or an argument and explaining three quarters of the way through it, say things that are in her head that she's not going to filter and it'll, she won't even remember she said it. It'll, it'll just pop out and that, that stuff is where it's really at. Even more so, I was in a meeting prior to this Let's say that somebody started to cry. We're, we're as a society, society set up that if somebody cries, we get them a tissue, we let them regroup, and they don't. I will tell you that when somebody's emotional and crying, the deeper that emotion, and you say it's okay, and you license them to continue, or you say, you know what, I, you tell them that you have an injury too, or you're vulnerable too. When that person's sharing, be it your spouse, your child, your friend, your partner, your client, the back end of emotion, they're going to say things that they won't even remember they said that's closer to the truth of what's going on. And in fact, you'll even, if, you, if you call them on it right away, the data stops. If you just sit there and spend the time to listen and to take it in, no taking notes, no stopping, all of this continues to come. Now you've got a bunch of new source data that you can ask about. And people watch and they say, I didn't say that. So, well, you did, but you're not holding it to it. But what, if, what is there about that? It allows for a better level of communication. As you can tell, I believe a lot in communication. Right. So on, on our digital media and all the rest, you've been great at showing us as an organization or set of organizations that have the technical ability, but also showing us that we care. Right. And some of the stuff that we put out isn't only technical, but it's also about things like I just talked about to provoke, does somebody listen or not, et cetera, to suggest that there's a difference. I will tell you, there are some professionals that run away from us because they need it to be technical only. Yeah. There's other professionals that come to us because they find good things happen with those clients. The question then is, do you wear your heart on your sleeve as an influencer or is that too distant for you? How much more open are you willing to be to let see people to see your real personality? The people need to know that I'm a general contractor by trade at a hammer and a law school. Is that a part of my story that I'm willing to release? Is it a part of my story that I want um, to be out there in the world? Am I willing to be vulnerable and say that I'm 56 and I'm not 46? What is that? Um, am I willing to say that a couple of weeks ago, I went in and had a heart test because they thought one of my bypasses was 90% blocked. I could make the argument that as a business owner, that chink in the armor would make people not want to work with us. I make the other side of me even say people would bond to that. 18 years ago, I had a massive heart attack and six bypasses. Thank God, a couple of weeks ago, they said everything's fine. Is that too vulnerable to put out on social media or friends or in a room? And then you have to choose. By all means, Dean, you taught us that we need to find ways if we're a hugging organization, if we engulf our clients, if we engulf our advisors, we've got people's back, how do we depict that? And you've helped us with that. Yeah, and 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 that's what I really loved is that um, from the moment that I met you, uh, all of you, you know, it was like, and that was important for me just based, a lot of people know my upbringing where I could have used a few more hugs and and that was my immediate attachment that I felt that um, I was cared for, uh, and and so in getting that hug and and feeling that, um, I, I've I've made it my mission since we got together that I want others to feel 
that hug from you and not just have to go all the way to San Diego and uh, get to that cool looking office that you're in or to an event to feel that hug and then have them uh, feel um, attracted or magnetic to get that hug. And it's interesting what you just said that I think uh, a lot of people in business are afraid of that, especially because we're, we're with a lot of advisors who are taught that you have to be in this box or stay in this lane and be a good advisor. And, and when I was, it takes me back to when I was at the CPA firm, I was a different guy that would get in trouble because I would just walk into the partner's office and say what I thought. And then, then they would go, um, Hey, you crossed the line. And I go, why is that so bad? But I, but I think we need to be more like that everywhere or is, or is that too open? No, I, I think there's decisions about your personal brand that you need to make and you need to challenge by somebody like Jackson or yourself and decide where your parameters are. Um, your big push to us um, fell in line with one of my mentors earlier on who since passed away, Mark Miranda. And Mark said, do you want to communicate the things that you want to say? Or do you want to communicate the things that cause people to want to engage in? And that was a marketing shift for us. Were we writing to serve our need to explain, or were we writing for an advisor to feel like they would like to work with us? Or were we writing to have a client see what it would be like to us and feel the ability to say, yes, I want to be around them, and my experience matches what was written? That was, a, that was a shift for us. When we entered the digital world from the print world, you pushed us pretty hard on, that's what everybody else says. When I go to your event, when I'm around you, here are the things I feel. I talk to the people that are close to you. This is what they value. Let's communicate that online. And I said, I don't know how to do that. Um, we can do a lot of interaction, and I've got somebody to play with. We're good. Talking to this damn thing by myself? I don't have an interaction or a play, and I don't do remote viewing well. I can't see into the soul of the person that's going to see it two months later on um, what that is, and I need the interaction. And you said, well, let's talk about how to make that happen. Right. So more and more, we've gone down that path. And if you were to look at our digital interactions before you or after you, you would see more of our soul after you than before you. And now it's the point where there's a lot of rawness out there that people see as well as technical and et cetera, that, and the diversity of it, like more of what we are. And we track what people tend to watch or do or like. We do more of it. But that fact of a culture issue. Did I answer the question or did I just talk to you about it? Yeah, no, I just think, I think there's an, uh, you know, in, in, um, uh, my, uh, my new book, which you're in, of course, uh, I, I talk about the, they got it, by the way. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I recommend other people go figure it out. Go to, I, there was a place you told us to go, but when we clicked it, it took us to our Amazon and it made it go, made it easy and show you the same. So thank you for telling oh, me. Yeah, that. absolutely. And that free version is over, I think today, they only give you like two days to do it, but I just want friends and family and it would be, uh, it would be 10 times the amount. It's got some cool stuff. <laughs> Not only to understand you and your history more, but if you were willing to share that history, what part of my history should I be sharing? I mean, if somebody was to read that book, they need to see that if you that you believe in what you do, you're willing to be very raw in that book yeah. about your past, both in business and not, that gives a, an understanding of what your bias is and what you're doing today. And then by what you value and who you talk about, they get to see more bias. So your advice is worth more or less based on their belief in your bias system. And you're willing to be that raw. People should pick it up just for that. Yeah. And, and that's where I, you know, I'm like, okay, this is it. It's almost like when you're in line at the, you know, I always explain, like when I was a kid, uh, my dad took me uh, to, uh, for my first big roller coaster ride, you know, the ones that are the clackety ones that are scary if you're like a 10 year old kid or whatever. And I'm like, I'm like, no, I don't want to go. And we're walking out of the park and I just stopped and I said, no, I want to go. 
And I changed at that moment and I went back, I got in line and I was scared the entire time. I was scared waiting in line, scared when I got in, scared when the click, 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 click thing was happening. And when I was writing that part of myself, I was, I was scared to death. So I wrote a whole chapter on fear because I think a lot of people in this world, uh, advisors especially, are fearful that they're going to seem weak because they're transparent and vulnerable about who they really are. Do you believe that? Oh, I think vulnerability scares the death out of most people. As we train counselors in the Institute for Alert Program, um, we get asked all the time, what's the, what are the most um, important factors? Being able, you were talking about a younger person, what our advice is, being able to overcome this vulnerability issue. Most people have an imposter complex, no matter how good they are, what they do, where they feel like any minute now, somebody's gonna walk in the room and explain to the people you're with, or God forbid online, why you don't deserve to be there. Yeah. Here's stuff about your past, here's what's stuff about your current, here's what you know or you don't know. And therefore, this imposter complex is, you don't have to be the right to be there. And you can look at any autobiography, not biographies written by others, but autobiographies of famous, strong people, and they'll say the same thing. So you're in good company if that's true. One of the ways to overcome that, to have some quiet confidence in front of others without the panic or dry or wet palms and dry mouth and all that, is to use those things you're vulnerable about and drop them right on the table. And by being vulnerable, you become invulnerable. Because that thing you were worried about coming out is already out, and nobody can hold it against you. So it's the, it's the dropping it off early. The second part is, if you're in a business where you want to connect with another person, sharing things that are true about you that you're a little uncomfortable about licenses them to do something similar. Won't always happen, but it lets them know that's a safe place. And as they dive deeper into what their stuff is, are you willing to give them a form to talk and occasionally mention something as almost as deep by you to say, we've got that relationship it's safe to go do this because it's mutually assured destruction. I can't tell anybody about yours because I'm telling you about mine and I don't want the world to know about that. Or I'm, I'm, I, um, I'm showing vulnerability in front of you. I know that if somebody who's very powerful comes before me and we're talking and they ask me for help, I will probably turn the world upside down to help them. I know that somebody who's very powerful comes before me and demands of me or threatens to me. I'll call in my entire team of companies and people to defend against that. And then as soon as that's over with, to attack that individual afterwards to make sure they don't do it again. The, look at me. These are radical examples. I would say that's true for most people. Yeah. For most people, there's a, I want to help you or I'm going to be mean to you, or I'm going to withdraw. Wouldn't it be great to live in the world if I want to help? I mean, you know, you make an appointment. My wife currently has an appointment to get a CAT scan of her head. And she has a variety of things. She's been to the doctor, and they're ruling out a bunch of stuff, and she needs to one test. And she's fairly aggressive. We've got a PPO, and she's used to calling our doctors and getting whatever she wants, when she wants, because she has the ability to call Joe or his team to ask to do it if it doesn't happen. So she's used to things happening. Yeah. It's told after the doctor appointment and they call this place, she calls them to schedule and they say, you have to wait till we call you. That frustrates her, but she decides to live with it as better with sugar than uh, and honey rather than vinegar. She calls two days later and they say, we never got the order from the doctor. We haven't even started looking. And she escalates. At one point, my daughter, my 13 year old looked at her and said, mom, if you get more mad at that lady that's trying to help you, you won't get an appointment for a month. <laughs> You're a nice, loving mom who just says, can you help me? And my wife said, it was a moment for my wife where she said, but I want to be pissed. And then she thought, but I really need this test. So she told the woman, I'm sorry. It's really important to my doctor and me. I'm sorry I didn't get it. How can I help? And I drive the doctor and drive it over. No, it has to be digital. How long is the process after that? What we do? Lady said, you know what? I have a slot that opened for tomorrow. I'll reach your doctor now. If they send electronically, I'll give you that slot. As opposed to the month later that she was looking at. 
So it was that her choosing to have this interaction based on the 13-year-old's clarity of the moment. I'm like, I have a 13-year-old daughter, so she's not always clear. <laughs> but she's but she's transparent. And thank God for it. Well, and it's interesting, uh, and and uh, you know, I'm sending prayers that that uh, all that goes in the right direction. And it's interesting, Kevin chimes in here. I'm in this space, even though I know it's in my head, it still paralyzes me. Yeah. Uh, I think that's profound because how much of our life have all of us missed because of these fears? And and you know, you and I have had lengthy conversations. I've studied this and done a ton of work to to understand the psychology of this and everything else. And it's it's interesting that you know there there was a, a profound statement made to me by a doctor friend of mine, and I listen to him much like I listen to you. And he's like, Dean. Every time you feel fear, it's an opportunity. And that's all he told me. And he just dropped the mic, you know? And so what do you say to, to, to that part about when it paralyzes you? Well, I've got two things. One, um, one of my partners, Scott, is famous for quoting Richard Nixon when he says, just because I'm paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get me. So <laughs> yes, it happens here, but there still could be this negative thing going on. Just because you're paranoid doesn't mean it's not true they're not out to get you. So I'm not going to dismiss the feeling of the thought. However, there is a group out of Waconner, Washington, and their group is called Pransky and Associates, P-R-A-S-K-Y and Associates. P-R-A-N. P-R-A-N-S-K-Y and Associates, Shelly reminded me. And they, their work is based on Sid Banks' work. And I'm going to give it a disservice by giving it such a short conversation. But the vast majority of how I feel is not based on the data coming at me or the circumstances coming at me, but how I'm reacting to that. And I know that to be true because how I feel about the meeting I just walked out of right now is different than the way I felt about it in there when I was all worked up. And tomorrow I will have wished that I would have said something different. And it's the same set of facts, but I'm processing differently in the moment than in, and now when I'm talking to you, as it's going on in the back of my head, and I will tomorrow. And depending on how I process that one thing, can it affect the balance of my day? Could this interview be better or worse because of it? Could the client that I will see next be better or worse because of it? And could the collection of those things affect myself and also Shelly sitting next to me, Jackson's um, watching in, Dean you're watching in, Kate was watching in, Bill and Kevin and Rick and Peter are online. Could I affect them in a good or bad way such that it caused the people they're about to touch? It all stems from realizing that when I'm counseling with somebody, what's going on in their head has more to do with their feeling of their reality than what I'm saying. And for me, what's going on is more. And I don't mean to go too far in the airy fairy world of this, but yes, the one square foot up here is where all the game is played, no matter what it is. And I know that because tomorrow I would feel differently about it than I do now. From a very selfish perspective, Steve and I sought this stuff out because I go from feeling hurt to feeling angry like that. Yeah, did And I go from feeling angry to retribution like that. So it's bam, bam, bam. And I'm suddenly in retribution mode, either by an action for a third party, physically, or my voice. And I'm somewhat talented in the English language. And I create a mess. And I was tired of cleaning up the messes that I created. So I had to find a way to notice it coming and to realize that it's really about what was happening here, not about what they said to me, but how I was processing to get me to the Steve true necessary kind crap <laughs> and to get me to the curiosity instead of my angry crap. And it's helped our business. It helps my relationships. 
Do I fail often? Yep. There are times that I see, I, I have a social media post that I shared with you, and it's a box and it's all kind of cardboard box kind of torn up a bit on a playing field, <laughs> grass and, and turf underneath it in a, like a track field. And it's full of these red cloth things. And on the side of it, it says red flags. And underneath it, it says, even though it's clearly marked, I think I'll date it for six months. <laughs> and it's exactly how I feel when I'm starting to act stupid. Right. I see the red flag. I know I shouldn't do it. And I'm so worked up, I just don't even give a damn. And like Peter said, it's the disadvantage of being a guy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and uh, as the true Sicilian son, right? <laughs> yes, and that is true for me. Um, that story is a very vulnerable one for me. Um, I was at Cranston Associates, and it was a year or two after my dad's death. I brought my mom up because she was really um, ill and having hospitalizations regularly, and the doctors were telling me that it was more to do with depression than the medical illnesses. And I brought her up there um, and... My mom and they sit down and they say, my mom says, I'll do this for these four days. But Joe, only if you do. And I said, I'm fine. And she said, well, clearly you're acting out. And one of my good friends, George, says, I've gotten more than a dozen phone calls, Joe. Of people knew that you were bringing your mom up that wanted to tell me about how stupid you're acting. I said, I have no idea what you're talking about. He said, yeah, I know. You just can't see it. So um, there was counseling for a number of days with one of these advisors. And it was not going well. I was ripping them to shreds because I couldn't bear her back. And um, he finally interacted with me and he asked me the same question multiple times. He said, who are you, Joe? And I just, I kept on answering. It was like two hours of this pain of him answering, asking me give another answer and that ain't good enough. And I finally blurted out with, I'm a Sicilian son. He said, now we're getting somewhere. Who are you when the Sicilian's dead? I cursed at him and walked out of the room, went to the hotel to pack myself. And he had his assistant slide a note underneath my door that said, don't leave, meet me for a crab dinner. And I reluctantly met him for the crab dinner and I said, okay, fine. Now we know what the problem is, help me. And he said, no, I'm not gonna help you because you don't need help. You just needed to see the box. Now that you've seen it, your mind will deal with it. I'm okay, you're fine. I said, no, I'm out of a friggin' wreck. I've been a friggin' wreck all afternoon. He said, good, you should be. You've been a jerk for a while. So I, I, I that maybe that's too vulnerable on you saying that um, on the Sicilian sun, but that keys me into remembering that there are big events that happen in our life that affect others, other moments, maybe my relationships. But then when you see that for what it is, I watch coming in the room, my wanting to please my dad and therefore acting out, I actually see it happening and I recognize it. And then I decide, am I still going to act out because I feel justified? Or do I know what the source is and can I throttle down for that? I think we all have that stuff. Yeah, we do. Yeah. And uh, that's... And I still radically love my dad. It's been 17 years that I've been without him. I radically love him. And I radically miss him, and I want him to be proud of me, and I can't get that measurement right now. I'm sure one day he'll be able to tell me what he probably did. But is that driving how I parent? Is that driving how I do business because of him? Or does it not enter? All I want is when, it, when I'm acting out, I can see which red flag it is, I can make a choice about it. And I think it helps us counsel. It also helps me choose how to influence do I like older about those things or not? Clearly, somebody's going to watch this and say, he must suck as a tax attorney if he's got that emotional issue. And somebody else will say, you know what? I feel that way too, or I understand that feeling. He's human. I want that. Oddly enough, I'd rather have client advisor B than client or advisor A. Absolutely. And I think I think that's the message of the day is is if you become your true self, you'll you'll actually attract and connect and allow yourself to connect to those that you truly deserve to be with. I think so. I really do. Um, we, by accident or by purpose, choose the people that we're hanging out with. Yeah. 
when our business model isn't stable, we tend to take things we shouldn't. And it draws down on the rest of our energy, freedom, and love. Man, that's profound what you just said. Say that again. When our business isn't stable. When our business isn't stable, we tend to take on work that doesn't fill us. And you need a litmus test. Um, we talked earlier that we like these people. Are they within the center core of business where we can both benefit each other and do they have follow through? So that's a litmus test about a relationship. I will also say for me, for myself and the people on our team, like showing the balance of our team, when that project comes up, do we have the boundless energy to handle that with no big deal? Do we have the freedom to say no, that we don't need it? And do we have the love for the work that we're doing? Is it in our center core? And do we love doing it? When we take on projects that we don't have the energy for because we're exhausted, we don't have the freedom to say no because we need the money, and we don't have the love for it, but we're doing it because it's revenue, that's bad. When we work with people that we don't like, that's bad. When we work with people, when we work on a project that's not within our core competencies, but we could force it, we had to, takes 20 times the amount of time and the product sucks. And when we work with somebody whose follow through is bad, we have to do all the follow through and the, everybody's still unhappy because it's behind. So we've got to be able to have that kind of a litmus. I wish I could say that we always remember the litmus test. That's awesome. We fall into the pattern of missing the litmus test and we pay for it dearly. Yeah. Yeah, and as Rick says, it's okay to say no to people. It actually benefits both of you in the long run. So, um, Yeah, that's true. But one of the problems is, for those of you that are entrepreneurs out there, I'm willing to bet that you remember that on the 1st or the 5th of the month, you have rent and payroll due. And on the 15th or 20th of the month, you have, you have payroll due. Mm -hmm. And then you have a bunch of other bills as well in your personal life, et cetera. But those things roll up every two weeks. And they're usually the biggest numbers in our organization. Right. Or the, is this payroll and this rent thing. And maybe you've got a, a cost of goods or something else. But the constant pressure of that sometimes causes somebody to say, that thing's coming, it's a lot, therefore we must take this on. And the more you start to do planning ahead, three months, six months, nine months, a year, um, is you're saying we're going to need that for this next big project. We need that revenue. Let's take that on because of that revenue. And I completely agree um, that people will say, just don't take business. It has to be profitable. Just don't take this. Saying no is very important. And that's very true in the abstract. And it's very true when you're financially stable. Right. When you're starting out and you're trying to get it out, or when you're running and you're running into trouble, that doesn't happen. And to suggest theoretically that it's a better practice you should know better ignores the reality of the pressure of having to get it done. I would rather I realize the pressure of having to get it done and then making the choice, am I going to do that? Many businesses take um, a project because of cash flow, because their overhead is fixed, take it without the profit, so it produces the cash flow to pay, although it's not profitable. Silly business move, but could I decide to do it for this one time? Right. Instead of having a rule that you never realize if it doesn't fit and why you're doing it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Joe, I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart and from our audience too, uh, those of you that are listening on Facebook Live as well as on the Zoom channel here, uh, as well as those of you that download the podcast. Um, uh, we just want to uh, thank Joe tremendously for uh, your advice and wisdom. And, and a lot of times we hear these things, but it's a good reminder of why they're important to us. Um, and so uh, as we do that, we like to invite, um, and Kevin Hugh said, uh, thanks, Joe, as always, as well. Um, and uh, so uh, we want to invite uh, Kate and Jackson back just in, in the audience. If you could just jump in. Um, uh, and, and let us know the one takeaway that you got from hearing Joe today and, and how that's helped you. And then we'll, uh, we'll announce our winners here and let everybody go. But um, uh, Jackson, since it's your birthday, we'll let you go first. What'd yes. You so um, 
I, I think the biggest thing that stood out to me was when Joe was talking about uh, the imposter complex. You know, there's constantly the fear of someone coming in and, you know, saying, uh, giving a reason why you shouldn't be there. And I, you know, I think that's something that a lot of us can relate to. And I thought that was uh, probably the, one of my favorite parts of uh, the interview was that, you know, when he talked about that, just because that's something, you know, I deal with being so young in the business world is like, I, I constantly have to, for the longest time, I had to, you know, struggle to get my point across because people always just saw a kid wearing a tie, you know? And uh, so I stopped wearing a tie. Um, <laughs> but that, you know, that's, you know, one of the biggest things. And, you know, uh, you, people just have to get out there and, you know, not worry about that. You know, just look past that. You know, no one's going to, the only person that can prove why you should be there is you. And I think that's the biggest uh, takeaway for me, at least, is, you know, just doing the best that you can do and pr proving to yourself that you should be there and not listening to the people that are like, you know, that are going to come out there. Cause there are going to be those people, you know, especially Twitter's like the biggest one, but um, it, it's just constant, you know? And I think that's something that a lot of people need to look past and move forward on. Yeah. Excellent. Kate, how about you? You know, my favorite thing about this whole session was just how, uh, Joe and Shelly, Stacy, the whole team over there, how much they just want to help, you know, and, and he, he talked about it when he talked about picking the right clients that you can help and that you want to help and just how his personality is so loving and giving and he wants to help. And I think the, the thing that a lot of us come across in business, whether we're entrepreneurs, whether we're just working for a company, whatever it is, is it's so, we never want to ask for help. We never want to ask. We never want to push that hard sale. You know, it feels vulnerable. But if you come with your values out first, which is wanting to help others, which I think Joe does such a great job of his whole organization, it's just authentic connections and the right clients that you attract. And it's all from just wanting to help and being a part of it. And I, I love that he puts those values through his business. Um, it's just one of my favorite things about him. Yeah, thank you so much, Kate and uh, Jackson, on that. Um, and for all of you out there, remember, our mission in here is that you're all influencers and you're all thought leaders like Joe Strazeri. And, and it's your job to take the value in what you've heard from Joe and share that with those that you care about today. And that's what we ask for each and every one of you. And especially to our two winners today, we pick one off of Facebook and one off of uh, the Zoom channel. And those are the ones that really engage and had questions. And it's got to be a tough choice today, Jackson. We had so many comments on social media and everywhere. So who's our two winners today? Uh, so we have Peter Chrisman and James <laughs> Gustin. Oh, James, James Gustin. <laughs> James Gustin commented on literally every single thing we said. It was uh, like amazing. <laughs> so Joe, uh, these are, uh, we run two channels here and uh, we're on Facebook live stream and as well as Zoom. And so uh, this has got to be one of the top engaged uh, sessions we've ever had. So thank you for, thank you for for bringing it to the surface and uh, bringing yourself to the show and to the surface and, and really bringing out the things that are important about us being genuine and authentic in the world. So again, from all of us here, we just want to thank you again from the bottom of our heart and we will send out Joe's websites and his social media uh, contact information with the show notes and uh, give everybody an opportunity to connect and feel that hug that comes from San Diego to the rest of the world. So Joe, thank you again. And um, we'll see you all online. Take care, everybody. Thank you for listening to the Influence Factory podcast. We welcome feedback and suggestions. You can provide these by visiting our website at www.myinfluencefactory.com. And if you are interested in Social Jack's 90 Days to Influence program, you can simply go to 90daystobusinessinfluence.com and simply ask for the next steps. While our program airs regularly on Zoom webcasts and Facebook Live on Wednesdays at noon central, we invite you to download episodes on your favorite channel, YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spreaker, SoundCloud, and who knows where else in the future. 
We will also provide occasional on-location live streams with special guests that we will announce in our community Facebook group, Business Influencer Alliance, as well as on all Social Jack channels. Our mission is to help you build your digital business influence with this podcast, as well as inspire, educate, and entertain those who are hungry to collaborate in a cool place with cool business professionals just like you.